This next video is a continuation of finding characteristics of polynomial functions. These are just probably some characteristics you have not found before. So the first um, that we're going to look at is whether or not the polynomial function is an even function or an odd function. And um, I laid out the notes probably not as well as I could have. So what we're actually going to do is we're going to flip to that back page where it says symmetry. Um, and we're going to talk about, we're just going to graph these real quick and talk about some symmetry so that we can refer to it when we talk about even and odd. So um, the first type of symmetry that we have here is with respect to the x-axis. And that's going to be something like a parabola on its side. So we're going to go ahead and draw a point at the origin. And then if you knew how parabolas grow, you might not. They go over one, up one, and then the next pattern is three. And then after that, it would be five. So I'm just doing that pattern for a parabola. And this would be like the equation, instead of y equals x squared, this would be x equals y squared. So this is symmetric to the x-axis. All right, uh, next we're going to talk about the y-axis. So as you can imagine, this would be like a regular parabola. So we're going to go ahead and draw the same pattern. And this would be symmetric with respect to the y-axis. And then last, we're going to go ahead and draw a cubic function. So this one goes over 1, up 1, and then it would go over 1, up 7, which we do not have room for. So I'm just going to kind of draw like that. I'm going to go over 1, down 1, and over 1, down 7, like that. Uh, and this one, you can see it's, it's um, symmetric with respect to the origin in that if you were to take this and kind of rotate it around the origin, it's like it's going around, and you can see the same little piece is down there. So we're going to say symmetric to origin. All right. So now if you look back at the previous page where it says even and odd functions, a function is even, if you think like parabolas, it's even, if when you plug in a negative x value, you still get the same y value that you originally had. So if you recall, like an f of x really represents a y value. So we're picturing an even function, which would be like this. So if I plug in positive 1, I get 1. If I plug in negative 1, I still get positive 1. So this would be considered an even function. Even functions are symmetric to the y-axis, which is why I was able to show you that picture. So points that are like x, y and negative x would still go to the same y. So we're going to use both of those points um, would help us prove that we're talking about an even function. A function is odd if when you plug in a negative x value, it changes the sign of the y value. So we're going to look at this an odd function like y equals x to the third, which is the cubic that we graphed here. If I plug in a positive one, I get a positive one up here. But if I plug in a negative one, I get a negative one down here. And so plugging in the negative changes the sign of the y value. So odd functions are symmetric with respect to the origin. So you'd have the original point x, y, and then if you plugged in negative x, you would get negative y. So that's what we're going to be looking for. All right, so as you can imagine, they're not always going to be as simple as x squared and x to the third. And I do have two examples down here that are x squared and x to the third, but we will be looking at other ones in class. And so the way that you're going to determine whether a function is even or odd when it has like an x to the third but then has some other things going on, or even if it has a radical in it or something. The way that we're going to determine that is we're going to plug in negative x for the x value, and then we're going to see what the result gives us, if it gives us the original equation that we started with, or if it gives us the negative version of the original equation that we started with. 
So for this one, to determine if it's even or odd, we're going to plug in negative x. And then we're just going to go through and kind of simplify that and see which, which one it gets us back to. So nothing to simplify here because this is just notation. Uh, negative x, and I wrote that wrong. Sorry, it should have been in parentheses then to the third. Negative x to the third would be negative x times negative x times negative x, which is negative x to the third. And then minus minus makes a plus x. So again, recall that our goal is to see if we're getting back to the original or if we're going to have a negative version of the original. So my goal is to get it back looking like this, which means I'm going to need to factor out that negative that's in the front. And then I have x to the third minus x. So what you'll notice is that if I plug in negative x, I get the negative version of the original graph, which means that this is an odd function. So we'll do the same thing on this one. We're just going to plug in negative x for each x in the problem, and then we're going to simplify. So negative x times negative x is x squared, and that was the original function, which means that this is an even function. All right. The next way um, that we're going to find characteristics of a graph is we're going to talk about continuity. So we have continuous graphs and discontinuous graphs. And continuous graphs are pretty easy to recognize. It just means if you were to take your pencil and trace the whole graph, you'd never have to lift your pencil. You could just trace it all the way through, um, and it would hit all the points. So here we're going to say that this graph is continuous. This graph right here, if you were tracing it with your pencil, you'd have to pick it up right here because there's a hole right there, and then you would have to keep going. We call this a removable discontinuity. And so the idea of removable is if I was to define this graph with a piecewise function, I could have the original graph as kind of this, and then if I had a piecewise function, I could go back and say, okay, let's put a point right in there, and then that would kind of make it continuous. Not really. But that's, that's what the idea of removable is, is that you could, like, plug that hole, basically. All right, this one, if we were to trace it, we'd have to pick up our pencil and then go. So this is called a jump discontinuity. So a jump discontinuity is always going to have a gap. And then if you can picture on this one, this looks like a rational graph. And there is an asymptote right here, which means that we have two curves that are getting um, closer and closer and closer to that asymptote, where the distance between that curve and the asymptote is getting closer to zero. So this is called infinite discontinuity. So the one that makes the most sense to think about for the unit we are currently in is um, jump discontinuity because we're talking about piecewise graphs. And then removable discontinuity and infinite discontinuity would be from rational graphs, typically. Um, and so we're going to look at those a little bit this unit, but we'll really focus more on that. Uh, the next unit, I just wanted to kind of introduce it all at once. So this first example, you see we have um, a rational rational function there. And so if you look here, if you remember um, what you've learned in math before is that we're not allowed to have zero on the bottom of a fraction. And so the x value that we're not allowed to have here is two. We have x cannot equal two. And if you guys recall what happens there, that actually makes a vertical asymptote. So we have a vertical asymptote at x equals two. And since it's an asymptote, this would be an infinite discontinuity. For the next graph, this is just a parabola. This is in, um, what is it called, intercept form, I believe. Um, and so it's giving us the two x-intercepts. So we have an x-intercept at negative 3, an x-intercept at positive 2. There's no reason for this to be discontinuous. Um, so this is a continuous graph. Nothing limiting us here. <laughs> 
And then if we look over at this one again, we have a rational function. And so here, if you recall from uh, Honors Math 3, we would want to factor the top and the bottom just to kind of see if this is a vertical asymptote or if it's a whole. So when I looked at the top, I recognize that that is the difference of squares. So I went ahead and factored that x plus 2 and x minus 2, and then the bottom is x minus 2. So I'm noticing these two things are canceling out. And if they cancel out like that, that means that instead of having a vertical asymptote, it means we've got a hole happening. So we're going to say that this is a hole at x equals 2. And since it's a hole, it would make it a removable discontinuity. All right, so last we're going to go ahead and finish these notes on symmetry. All right, so when we test for symmetry, um, we're looking, if we're talking about something that is symmetric to the x-axis, the original point would be like plugging in a positive x and a positive y. You'd get a positive y. And then the second um, point that is reflected over that x-axis would still be the same positive x, but now the y would be negative. So we're going to say x and negative y. Over here, like we said on the previous page, if it's symmetric to the uh, y-axis, then it's a negative x and positive y. And if it's symmetric to the origin, you're going to see a negative x and a negative y. So where that helps us here is if we're checking to see if it's symmetric to the x-axis, we're going to replace a y with a negative y. And if it gets you um, back to the original equation, then you know that it's symmetric to the x-axis. When you want to check to see if it's symmetric to the y-axis, you're going to replace x with a negative x and see if it gets you back to the original equation. And if you want to check to see if it's symmetric with the origin, then you're going to replace x with negative x and y with negative y and see if it gets you back to the original. So if you have a picture, you can kind of look at the picture to determine if it's symmetric. Of course, that would be too easy, so we're typically going to be finding it algebraically, which means we're going to be using this process here instead. So for these two examples, we're going to check all three of those symmetries. So first, if I'm checking to see if it's symmetric to the x-axis, I'm replacing y with negative y. So here's the y. So I'm going to say negative y equals x squared minus 4. And then there's nothing really to simplify there. And that is not an equivalent equation. That is a little different, so we're going to say no. Uh, if I'm checking the symmetry with the y-axis, that means I'm replacing x with negative x. And then I'm going to go ahead and simplify. So I get y equals x squared minus 4. That's a yes. That was exactly the same as the original, so that means it is symmetric to the y-axis. And then last, I'm going to go ahead and check the origin. So that means I'm replacing the y with negative y and the x with negative x. And we're going to simplify that there. That is not the same as the original, so we're going to say no. All right. uh, we'll do the same for this one. So seeing if it's um, symmetric to the x-axis, we're just going to replace the y with a negative y. And that doesn't really do anything when you simplify it. So that's a big fat no. With respect to the y-axis, we're going to be changing the x so here if we do negative x multiplied by itself four times that's going to give us x to the fourth uh, minus negative x squared would be just x squared plus three that's exactly the same as the original so we're going to say yes it is symmetric to the y-axis and then last, checking for symmetry to the origin, and at this point you probably feel like this is redundant. So we've got the negative y there, and then the right side simplifies to what we would want it to be, but the negative y means it doesn't match the original, so no.